Good evening, everyone. I am Sri Lekha Pale, host of the Conversations That Count that is supported by Fairfax County Republican Committee. For those of you that are new to this program, I'm Fairfax GOP Strategic and Community Engagement Vice Chair. On Conversations That Count, I strive to bring in speakers that are able to see through issues facing our communities and are able to help us navigate those issues and problem solve them for us. This session is focused on uncovering the issues our Fairfax County Public Schools, Loudoun County Public Schools, and all other local public schools are now facing, along with how best parents can be engaged in these schools to ensure parents know and understand what is going on in school. As most of you know, I'm a mom and my kids have gone to Fairfax County School and this one of them is still in Fairfax County Schools. So I'm one of those concerned and engaged parent myself. To discuss all of this, I have invited Luke Rosic to Conversations That Count. Luke is, not a, very, uh, is a very familiar face for most of you. He is an investigative reporter probing waste, fraud, and dysfunction in the federal government. He's an author and a computer programmer. Luke previously worked for the Daily Caller News Foundation and the Washington Post and live with, lives with his wife and children right here in our neighborhood. Luke, Luke welcome to Conversations That Count. Thanks for having me. Hey, look, as an investigative reporter with the Daily Wire, you broke stories that put Loudoun County Public Schools on the na national stage. I know I have a lot of uh, folks that uh, came to know that you're going to be on the show and are quite excited. They, they have personally told me that not only you put Loudoun County Public Schools on the national stage to unveil all of the issues going on in the school district, but you also have made uh, Glenn Youngkin win, so you got to take uh, credit for that. So tell me about it. I mean, what made you want to probe into Loudoun County Public Schools? Well, I started writing my book, Race to the Bottom, in 2019, very early in 2019, before coronavirus started. And, um, you know, basically no one was talking about schools at that time. People hadn't heard of critical race theory, but I had seen a couple things that really made me concerned. The One of them is Seattle public schools started teaching kids that math is racist. And, um, you know, this is Seattle is where Microsoft and Amazon are based. This companies desperately want to hire people who can do math. They want to pay them a lot of money. And they're having to bring in people from other countries on H-1B visas because our schools are not preparing them. And so here we had this lady who I wrote about in my book because she had just this whole crazy backstory where she moved her kid in with a convicted child molester and things like that. She was in charge of the equity program there. And she started telling kids that if they were black, math wasn't for them. Another thing that I saw was a push for busing um, that was coordinated here in this DC area, meaning 1970s style racial busing. And they did it in Howard County, Maryland. And they took, you know, they do the citizen feedback where you, they solicit comment and literally 98 to 99% of comments were against busing but they did it anyway. And so it moved 6,000 kids away from their, their, their peers and their friends really for no reason. It was based on this evidence that didn't, they didn't have any evidence supporting it was that it was going to help anyone in any way. Um, and they were doing that in a very coordinated way, a very similar way in Montgomery County, Maryland at the same time. And then they tried to do it in Fairfax. Um, and then the final thing that really got me convinced that something strange is going on with these schools is just realizing that at least at that time in 2019, there was 10 Democrats on the Fairfax County School Board, and not a single one of them had kids in the school system. And I was just so struck by that fact. I mean, if you're, and, and you know, okay, maybe from time to time, you'll have a, a school board member that for some reason doesn't have kids in the school system, but not a single school board member that was a Democrat, had kids in the schools. They were all there for their own reasons that had nothing to do with academics. And that caused severe consequences. And it was basically going on because people weren't paying attention. It wasn't that they were doing a great job. It wasn't that people genuinely supported what was going on. It's just that at that time, really no one was paying attention to schools or even local government. So uh, Luke, you bring up so many great points. Let's talk about this busing. Isn't that uh, one of those one fair facts uh, thing that they wanted to bus kids? Are you aware of that also? Yeah, I mean, I have a whole chapter in my book about one fair facts and how it came from these philanthropic foundations and was laundered in a very manipulative way 
to make it seem like it wasn't coming from hardcore political activists. Um, and, you know, basically they had all this totally false data and they were doing things like saying Fairfax could gain $4 billion if they do one Fairfax. And they were just kind of stating that as a fact, like, what does that mean? How do you get $4 billion? And the county supervisors were like, we want $4 billion. That sounds great. Um, some group wrote a paper that says we'll get $4 billion if we do this. And you look into it and they're like, well, well, if every racial group made the same as what you call it for a county would be higher. And so it, it doesn't make any sense. It's just basically stating if people made more money, then they would make more money. It's like a tautology. It's, it's totally lo a total logical fallacy. They didn't set out any way that they would achieve this. Um, and they used it to justify this policy that was really remarkable because it's one of the only policies, I think the only policy that it applies to both the county government and the school system, and it governs every subsequent policy. So it's like this umbrella policy. And so what you had is all the, um, like the superintendent was basically saying, we have to do busing. We don't have a choice because one Fairfax has already passed and it obligates us to do that. Um, and so there's all this data showing very clearly that busing kids based on race will not improve their academic um, performance. There's just no one can make that sincere argument that if there's a lot of kids in a poor neighborhood and then you just move some, it's not, academic success is not contagious. You don't, you don't become smarter by sitting near a smart kid. And you can show that very clearly because there are right now in Fairfax County schools that have various demographic makeups. And what they can see from Fairfax's data is when you look at kids who have free lunch, that kid is going to have the same test scores, whether he's in a school that's 10% free lunch or 90% free lunch. And so they know full well that this isn't going to work. It's not going to help anyone. It's, it's going to cause severe social consequences. It's going to cause massive instability for a whole county. And they be became obsessed with moving kids around based on race um, way back in 2019 when really no one was paying attention. And I, and I still think that 1970s style race-based busing is on the horizon. And I do think it's one of the most destructive things that can happen to a community, which, you know, people that um, are a little bit older than me and lived through the 1970s, they all, that was the conclusion that people came to at the time. So they're, they're trying policies that objectively we know not to do the things they're claiming they're going to do. It's dishonest. And there's a human cost and it all is designed to um, make the statistics look better for school system administrators. Like right now there are schools, especially like in the Mason district, I think where huge portions of kids can't even read. And so what they want to do is scatter those illiterate kids all over the county so that they can kind of fly under the radar. And they're absolutely still going to be illiterate. It's just that there's, it's not going to be popping out on a spreadsheet that makes you go, oh my gosh, the Fairfax County School Board is totally failing at what they're supposed to be doing. Absolutely. Look, you brought up about 2019. We had several school board candidates that were excellent. Uh, if you look at their issues, they were very focused on academic achievement, bridging the academic achievement. Now it starts, uh, since you said that the current school board members never had any kids in the school, I really want to go back and look at those uh, palm cards to see then what did they run on? I guess where I'm getting to is, Luke, if um, uh, I consider I've been living in Fairfax County for the past 15, 16 years years and the colleagues that I work with, the community partners that I work with are all very smart people. So why do you think voters are not thinking it through saying that if I am going to go and vote for a congresswoman or congressman, I want to vote for the congressman that has a record of working within my district and has worked for the policies. I wouldn't go and vote for somebody that comes from New York yesterday. So what, what do you think is going on with these educated, uh, so-called educated and informed voters? How did 2019 uh, school board even happen? <laughs> it is really frustrating because it wasn't long after the election that coronavirus happened and a lot of other bad things happened with the schools. And people started doing like talking about like, can we do a recall? And it's like, no, we, we, we just elected these people. You had your chance and you voted for the people without researching them. Um, and, you know, they may be educated, but they're also highly partisan. And they frankly didn't research these people at all. They just elected whoever the sample ballot that the Democrats handed them um, said. And, you know, there were situations like the prosecutor's race where 
uh, Ray Morrow, who was our longtime Democratic prosecutor, he lost his primary by 1%. And he said, guys, don't vote for Steve Descano, who just beat me in the primary. I'm a Democrat. He's essentially an anarchist. This isn't my, you know, the party that the Democratic Party that I know, Steve Descano is not part of that. But most people never heard that. That was a very low turnout primary. And when the general election comes around, a lot of those people don't even know if Steve Descano is new or if he's the incumbent. They're just checking the name with the D next to it. So I think there's some really destructive things that happen when you have a, a, a very homogenous and partisan electorate, because we have a political system with checks and balances and partisan tension for a reason. Um, neither party is right all the time. And it's good to have people with differing perspectives in the room so that um, they can, you know, prove it, you know, present competing visions and ask, ask probing questions and hold people accountable. And I think even in 2019, prior to that election, when you had two Republicans on the bat, on the school board, they couldn't control any votes, but things functioned a lot better just because they were there and they could say, excuse me, can you into detail on that policy a little bit because this part doesn't make sense to me and as soon as you ask a couple of probing questions a lot of what they're trying to do falls apart and so they were very insistent that there not even be one republican on the board which to me indicates that they don't actually terribly believe that their policies can stand up to scrutiny absolutely luke i was also part of the 2019 i was running as a supervisor so i've kind of seen the entire thing and um, I mean, I have to give credit to our school board members, especially Vincent Palatingal. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with him. He was uh, pr pretty much predicting what's going to happen with TJ literally in 2019, like it was happening right in front of us unfolding. And um, uh, it's kind of strange to see that every word kind of came through. Uh, Luca, I mean, when a few parents heard that you're going to be on the podcast, they actually texted me and wanted me to ask you about a book you wrote on the problems in K-12 schools called Race to the Bottom. Uh, I, I, I found uh, the subheading actually very interesting where you said uncovering the secret forces destroying American public education. Can you talk to us about that? I mean, I'm sure by now you realized I'm an immigrant. I have a thick accent. <laughs> uh, and um, when as an immigrant, I think I know now better to kind of understand that just don't take the word for it. We all thought American public education was the best education, and I think it still is. But however, I, I, I absolutely agree with you that there are some secret forces that I can't even fathom that are definitely trying to destroy how uh, American education was built on. It was meritocracy, it was inclusive. So what do you think um, is happening? I mean, I want you to talk about your book as well. Well, some of the secret forces are, it's funny because among conservatives, you hear a lot about George Soros and things like that. The story is a little different when it comes to schools. It's actually the Ford Foundation, the Kellogg Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, you know, these are actually as radical, at least as George Soros. At times, they literally fund groups that espouse promoting communism and overthrowing capitalism. And those are the groups that essentially control K through 12 education. Um, K through 12 education costs nearly a trillion dollars a year. It's not the kind of thing anyone can just waltz in and like get serious influence over because it's so big and so decentralized. But if you think back to like Common Core 10 years ago was a big education controversy around 2012 or so. And the Gates Foundation was almost entirely behind that. And that's been kind of well documented and was at the time. So the same foundations are now doing things like CRT. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's interesting that the Ford Foundation has flown below the radar to the extent that it has, because it has like a, fr a, fr a frightening history and they've always been obsessed with race and they've always been wrong. And that goes for all these other foundations, too, that came about in the early 1900s. Um, they were initially pushing things like eugenics. And the Kellogg brothers would get together at their compound with the Rockefellers and the Fords, and they would plot essentially how to get rid of undesirables, by which they, they, they meant essentially uh, minorities. Um, and so you fast forward 100, and they particularly didn't love, there's, um, you know, the Kellogg brothers, and this is, of course, the cereal, the family that went on that made billions of dollars selling breakfast cereal. Um, 
you know, a hundred years ago, they're sitting around saying, well, we know that the Negro is inferior, but we also know that we can't let the Asians succeed or they're going to push whites out of the way. And it's a horrifying thing that he said, but then you fast forward a hundred years. And that's essentially what places like New York City were doing at the time with their magnet schools. They were um, saying very overtly, we need to put more blacks in there through aff affirmative action because there's too many Asians and they're making the rest of us look bad. And so, you know, these foundations are, are highly partisan and, and generally um, in a liberal way, but they, they, a lot of times they attack like the Biden administration because they're far, they're, they're further even to the left than the, you know, mainstream Democratic Party. But there's also this continuity of the racism that's been in, in like sort of uh, one of the defining attributes of these phil philanthropic foundations for a hundred years. And so they're injecting huge money into the public school system for all these initiatives. Um, and that is you pick any kind of activist group that you're seeing in education, it's typically going to fund go flow back pretty directly to being funded by one of these foundations. And they don't, it's not like the foundations are funding existing nonprofits. What they do is they'll say, well, we want to put our money into a new topic, say racial equity in education. And then what happens is every nonprofit in the country suddenly wants to get into that sector because that's where they can um, be successful in getting a grant because they know that's where the money's being offered. Effort. Look, as much as I think I know, the more you speak, the more I am like, wow, wow. <laughs> so I, I know that uh, most people, at least that are listening, or at least myself, I can say we are very familiar with these uh, philanthropic foundations such as Ford, Keller, Gates, and all. So, um, if you can just talk to me a little bit about Annie E. Casey MacArthur or certain, I'm sure there are also three elements in moving this critical race theory from academic papers to society. And I also think that Americans really need to pay attention to these philanthropic foundations. I think these are the most powerful and least understood forces in American politics. So can you talk to me about those three foundations, which I don't think people are familiar and it's important that people get familiar with those foundations as well. Yeah, you know, the people who control this money, they're essentially giving away other people's money, right? The philanthropic executives, and they really just hijack these huge pots of money. For example, the certain foundation is the word Andrews backwards. There was a Republican congressman about 100 years ago named John Andrews, and he dedicated his money because he, he, when he died, he left his money to help orphans. But later on, some philanthropic executives took control of it. And his family said and started um, spending it on these groups that um, I have the quotes in my book, I don't have them in front of them, but it's like the quotes are remarkable because what they're spending, what they're sending the money to almost explicitly says what we need to do is take control of all the major industries for the state and get rid of um, free markets. It's basically talking about enacting communism in the US, um, totally a fringe group. And this um, certain a foundation um, gave them a ton of money. And that was kind of what all it was basically giving grants for these fringe groups left and right. And so this congressman that long ago, he made his money as a capitalist, etc, came to this foundation and said, you're totally betraying what our grandpa or whoever um, wanted this money to be for. And the philanthropic executives are like, well, he may not like this, but there's nothing he can do about it. He's dead. Uh, what's he going to do about it? So they're really kind of radical and aggressive. And they pollinate from foundation to foundation. And so one of the things that I show in my book is how these specific policies and this weird language they have will migrate from the Ford Foundation to the Casey Foundation to the Cerdna Foundation as the executives jump from one job to another. Um, the Casey Foundation is kind of similar. Casey was, uh, I believe, the guy that started UPS. And he was a um, you know, it was originally controlled by conservatives and they took over the foundation far leftists did by using all this um, fancy language that kind of, um, you know, how the, the woke talk and how the social scientists talk. And they use these crazy long words that no one's ever heard about. No one's ever no one knows what the heck they're talking about. It's like these this weird language they have. And so they were using these fancy academic words to obscure what they were doing. And some of the board members are like, oh, my gosh, like I'm conservative and on the board of this foundation. And I just realized that we hired a CEO that's um, extremely far left. Uh, I think the I, I, I don't know if the final foundation you mentioned was MacArthur, but that's an important one. 
Um, they're the ones that funded the 1619 project. But what's so interesting when you lay it all out is it wasn't like the 1619 project just suddenly appeared in the New York Times. Um, for like 10 years, they were every step of the way with Nicole Hannah Jones, they were investing in her career, subsidizing what she's going to do next. Um, it, a lot of the people um, involved in 1619, every single one of them kind of traces back to the MacArthur Foundation. And then after she uh, somehow got paid by the New York Times without writing an article for like two years and went into um, become a college professor, that was because of the MacArthur Foundation too. So they're very, they, they play a role behind the scenes deliberately because that's what they do. They don't do things on their own. They fund things, but they're like a puppeteer. Like they're very strategic and they play the long game. And a lot of the things we're seeing now with what, um, you know, a lot of people now call CRT in schools, the foundations have very deliberately been implementing that over a very long period of time. Look, I have to commend you for doing all of this research because regular moms and dads like us uh, would have no understanding. We would just think they're great foundations. But let me let me also talk to you about consultant groups, Luke. I know consultant groups such as uh, Charlatan Consultants, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, that are pushing this racial stuff too. I've read that in your book, but I also have read that uh, quite a bit in, um, in some other books. What incentives do you think they have as a consultant group? I mean, you would think they would stay away from um, these topics. Well, it's a huge industry now to come in and do these equity audits. And, you know, basically you hire a company like the Equity Collaborative in Loudoun, and it's their job to find out is, is Loudoun County Schools racist? And then what do you know? The answer is always yes, because once they say, say yes, the next step is to give another contract to the same people that audited it to fix the problem that they say is there. Um, but some of these groups are, they do things that are like patently racist on their own. The group that, that, that equity collaborative in, uh, Loudoun, um, they were called in originally to address, uh, there was this claim that kids were being asked to pretend to be slaves as a PE exercise. And that showed that Loudoun County was racist. So they hired a firm to fix Loudoun County's racism. Well, guess what? That firm had ties to consultants who ran that very same exercise as an anti-racist exercise. They would have the kids pretend to be slaves because it made them, you know, understand racism or whatever. Um, and so <laughs> there's a really obvious interest in um, these consultants claiming that schools are racist because it brings in the big bucks and there's just millions and millions of dollars being shelled out to these people. Um, one of the things I was most struck by is how much of all of what we're seeing now in the schools traces back to just one consultant named Glenn Singleton. And he has this firm called the Pacific Education Group, and it's more commonly known by um, its trademark, Courageous Conversations. And so you'll hear that term in Fairfax County because they hired him long ago and he kind of set them down this road of equity. But whenever you hear courageous conversations, they're talking about Glenn Singleton. And Glenn Singleton is the guy who, even in the 1990s, was distributing worksheets to teachers to train them that, quote, the written word is racist. Showing up on time and working hard is white attributes. Black people like joking around, not working hard. Um, kind of crazy racist things. And just as I looked into the lady in Seattle who was in charge of the equity stuff and found some really crazy things in her background, I looked into Glenn Singleton and his background. I mean, he's a black guy. That's his whole thing is he's hired by school district, by white administrators at school districts to teach kids what it likes, what it means to be black, which is a weird thing to do. Right. Because like it, 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 schools in Baltimore have a lot of problems, but the kids not knowing what it's like to be black isn't one of them. That's just their race. They don't need someone to teach them what it's like to be their race. But this guy, Glenn Singleton, he went, to a Jewish day school where he was president of the horseback riding club. And then he went to an Ivy league college and then he worked on Madison Avenue in this fancy job. And so he was like the most privileged person imaginable. He was never like, you know, from the streets, knowledgeable about the inner city. And precisely because he knew nothing about what he would call black culture, he developed this chip on his shoulder and decided, well, I'm going to tell everybody what it means to be black and started. That was his business idea. Go from Madison Avenue, where he's making a, a big bucks to now has got this new job where schools will pay him to come in and teach everybody what it's like to be black. And it was like clearly just him reenacting or dealing with some adolescent 
identity issue where he always felt like he wasn't black enough. Um, and that's where a lot of these ideas come from. And people say, oh, CRT isn't real. When you're telling kids that there's no such thing as the right answer and that hard work is, is a white thing and not a black thing, um, that's CRT and that's on those worksheets. And Courageous Conversations is one of the biggest consultants in the country. It's been hired by a ton of school districts in this area as well as around the country. And that's kind of how this stuff spread beginning in the 1990s. Look, um, uh, I think be, being a hard worker is not a white or a black thing. It is just a human being trait. In fact, uh, I was driving home today and I was listening to some of the contrast between countries of why Switzerland has low resources, but is the most richest country is because the people have that work ethic, right? So I don't think it has anything to do with white, black, or Asian. I think, uh, in fact, I, I think minorities, when they come to this country, they realize that they have to work uh, very hard to get ahead. Head. So I don't think it is a white thing. I think it's right. Just and another thing where you really see the impact of critical race theory is critical race theory is always about only black and white. And that's such an outdated paradigm. It's because it comes from these 1980s, 1990s academics who were all black. And at that time, Hispanics and Asians were not as numerous in, in America. But in this day and age, when you look at the demographics of K through 12 schools, Hispanics vastly outnumber blacks and Asians are the fastest growing population. So the people who come in there and want to lecture you about how they care about diversity, but you don't, they're harping on what in Fairfax County is the smallest minority groups, Blacks at 7%, and they never really talk about Hispanics or Asians. Um, and so, yeah, if they're not really even sincere in, in their valuing diversity, it's this very particular worldview that developed decades ago, has no solutions, no track record of solutions, and doesn't even apply to, you know, the world of 2022. I think you bring up an excellent point. I hope people that are listening um, can comment on that or kind of make a mental note of it. I mean, we, we do have only 7% African-Americans. So the focus should be on Hispanic Americans who are about 16% and Asian Americans who are on 19%, especially in Fairfax County, but there is really no mention of that. It's, yeah. it's once you realize that, uh, you know, once I think we put that into people's minds, it's going to shock them. Like, wait a minute, they never really mention Hispanics. You know, the Democrats in Fairfax County never mention Hispanics because they don't care about minorities. It's just this weird CRT thing. Um, equity is around finding the lowest um, performing group when it comes to statistics and then making sure that everyone is that low. Um, and so that's what, yeah, really equity is, is bringing everyone down to the lowest common denominator so that we can um, say that everyone's equal. And so a lot of times the Blacks have lower aggregate test scores than Hispanics and things like that. So even though they're the smallest minority, um, that's why I think one of the reasons they focus on them is that's the level we got to bring everyone down to. We got to bring Hispanics down to the Black level. We've certainly got to bring the Asians down. And then we'll have achieved not utopia, everyone's going to be miserable, but at least we'll all be equal. Um, and so for the, it took a long time for people to figure out that equity is a horrendous thing. A lot of times they would say, yeah, you know, it seems like something's wrong in Fairfax County. They talk about equity, but the results are not very good for minorities. Maybe they're implementing equity wrong. And that's kind of like when people say every time a communist country fails, they say, well, it wasn't real communism. Uh, real equity has never been tried. Real communism has never been tried. No, this it is equity. What all the results we're seeing with the school shutdowns and and now the the um, we're seeing the the blacks and other poor minorities being harmed the most in terms of academics because of the schools being shut down. Those things were all predictable. People were saying them at the time, but they were saying, what did the Chicago schools teachers union say? Um, advocating for opening schools is racist and sexist and all that. Um, you know, it's like uh, equity is something that every um, one who wants believes in meritocracy and believes in the power of technology and the power of hard work and the power of um, the ability to improve things um, is something that I think they just need to they need to be able to say, I oppose equity. Equity is a bad thing because it's not that they're doing it wrong. Equity is inherently um, basically malicious. 
So look, uh, I'm a healthcare professional by background. So I'm always skeptical when somebody says consultant is coming in to help us out. Uh, one thing I say is consultant creates the problems and then they want to solve the problem too. And also whatever the consultant says after taking million dollar contract and writing it down, I could go and survey my team of 50 or talk to 50 patients and I get the same conclusion. So I think um, uh, that uh, portion of consultants just doesn't make sense to me. And the other thing they do, they have our consultants for is to force them to do something and then that's unpopular and then say oh it wasn't us as a school board we told a consultant told us to do that and it's that's because they know that the people that have traditionally voted for democrats in fairfax county they don't really think the tj math test is racist they don't really want their kids to be bust the, the elected democrats want to do things that are not supported by the voters who generally view themselves as Democrats. They're deeply on popular policy initiatives. And so that's where consultants can come, come in and basically they're willing to take the fall in exchange for money. And the school board members then claim it wasn't up to them. Absolutely. Look, let me kind of divert you uh, a little bit to your uh, another book. I think you are the author of Obstruction of Justice, mm -hmm. How the Deep State Risks National Security to Protect the Democrats. And I must admit, you've been held as one of the most smartest, most diligent reporters in Washington and a bulldog for uncovering what is possibly the largest scandal and cover up in the history of the United States of House of Representatives. Can you briefly summarize that? I'd rather stay focused on schools, except to say that, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of my career um, focusing on Washington and, you know, no one was paying attention to the local government. And in some ways, local government is at least as powerful or more powerful than Congress because they're dealing with crime and public safety. They're dealing with the zoning, whether you're gonna have nice suburban yards or apartments going up in your front yard and they're dealing with schools. And I think that's, um, I'm really proud of the work that I did covering Congress, but that was an interesting revelation for me to say, all this stuff that I thought was the most important, if you're a reporter or you're in politics, you wanna to get to Washington because that's the major leagues. Well, it turns out that local government is just as important. And when no one's paying attention to it, that's when it creates this vacuum where really um, nefarious forces fill that vacuum. And you do see some of the same people like the activist foundations who are playing in Washington, they, I, I think they identified an opportunity to, to come um, to work through the local governments because they frankly didn't have any competition. Um, and so, they, you know, they could just come in and spend a little bit of money and elect a whole slate of candidates in these local races, or even just push policy positions to the ones that were already there. And they could get away with it because no one was watching. And so I know that with, um, coronavirus shutdowns, we saw a lot of parents begin to monitor their school systems and their local governments. And I hope that's going to continue. I hope people don't just go back to normal and say, well, schools are reopened. I don't need to monitor them anymore. Because the fact is the disastrous decisions that they made during coronavirus were um, coronavirus was essentially a symptom. The bad decisions that, that you saw them make there, those are the kind of decisions they've always been making. Um, things like operating schools as um, employment centers for the teachers union rather than serving the needs of children. Um, so those things are still going on and, and we as parents have got to um, remain vigilant and informed because we can do it. We're, you know, it doesn't take all that it's a little harder in Fairfax because uh, not to go on a, a, a tangent here, but there's a separate issue, which is local government is so important. And one of the reasons Fairfax has gone off the deep end is because it's too big. It has 1.2 million people in it. We don't, we essentially don't have a local government. We've been disenfranchised. Um, 1.2 million people is twice the size of DC. It's twice the size of certain States. Um, most people can, if they have a problem, they go to the mayor who might be their next door neighbor or their you know, chair of the school board who might live a block away and they see them at you know, soccer games or whatever. Um, we don't have that in Fairfax County. And what you have when you have these large entities is regular people are disempowered and who's in charge are the people that have like a big money and lobbyists and they almost turn it into a business, professional activism at the, at the county level. And so I think one of the most important things that Glenn Youngkin can do in Virginia, and especially um, working with the Republican-controlled legislature, 
is to enact um, a policy that actually is not partisan. It's breaking up the counties so that they're smaller. And one of the ways you can do that, it's not as radical as it sounds, um, you can create cities that are not part of the counties. And so basically the process is a little murky because it's around, been around since the 1700s, but you look at places like Falls Church City or Fairfax City or Manassas Park or Manassas, they all have their own, um, you know, in some cases, school systems, police forces, things like that. They are not part of the counties. Um, so what I think would be really um, at the, one of the things that would be most helpful to address the problems in Fairfax County Public Schools, but also a lot of the other problems we're seeing is for the legislature to send a signal that if communities of people get together and say that a majority of us want to create our own city, that the state in Richmond will grant that those group of neighbors a city charter. Now they're no longer part of Fairfax and you could see McLean kind of essentially secede from Fairfax, for example. Um, and then the one Fairfax starts breaking down because they can't redistribute from one group to another because the people who they're going to redistribute from are just going to leave. And it also reflects sort of diversity that people can have their own. You may have a town that's defined by its rural nature, preserving parks and trees. You may have another that likes that walkable, more urban feel. And it's kind of like to each its own. Um, so that's one of the things that I think Glenn Youngkin and the Republicans can do is say, um, we will grant charters to any group that wants to become its own city. You can then create your own um, school system. You can then have your own prosecutors who are actually going to enforce the law. And if you want to make like a far left town, go for that too. Anyone can do what they want to do. Um, because a lot of the things, if the Democrats take control of um, the legislature in the future, they can undo a lot of what Glenn Youngkin may do. But if they can establish new cities, those cities can be around in, you know, 100 years from now. Look, that's a very good point. Have you discussed this with the legislators or uh, Governor Glenn Youngkin? I mean, it's kind of strange that I, I'm hearing so much from you, but it just makes so much uh, the common sense, but I've not heard from anybody else about this. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I wish I could just uh, call up Glenn and, uh, you know, <laughs> let him know what I think. I, I haven't had that opportunity, but I, I think it's not radical. I think it would fit in with this whole mentality because it's not a radical proposition. It's not a, a partisan proposition. Um, I think a lot of times communities just have their own unique needs. And that's the problem with one Fairfax is Fairfax County is 400 square miles. We're not one Fairfax. We shouldn't be one Fairfax. It's absurd to suggest that we're all the same or we all have the same needs. We absolutely do not. Some of us live in pretty rural places. Some of us live in high rises. Um, some of us live very close to DC, some very far. There's so many differences and that's fine. We should embrace our differences and um, understand that you know local government is going to serve people in different ways. Um, and so I think it's just a matter of empowering people. And I think if you had a vote where most people in, say, McLean said we would rather be a city, and then the, the, the governor, the, and not the governor, but the state legislature said no, that's a very un-American idea. I mean, it comes back to the you know, Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that you have a right to be self-governed. And so I think I would love to see that push. And I think it's not overtly partisan, the Democrats kind of expose themselves by if they were to oppose cities getting essentially freedom, they would, I think they will, but they expose themselves because what they're saying is we want your money. We don't care if you like it. You're going to have to stay so that we can confiscate your money and, and make everyone equal. Um, but it's not up to them. I mean, if the state, it's the state that grants the charters. And if you can put it on a ballot and all you need is majority, you know, like 50.1%, um, and so I think that would be one of the, I think that is one of the, one of the, you hear so much about Virginia schools and it's not that Virginia is like further to the left or more incompetent than somewhere like California. It's that the jurisdictions are too big here. And you look at California, they've got small, smaller school districts. You look at somewhere like New Jersey, every town's got their own school district. That's totally common. It's not like some people think it's like a joke when I say that. It's not a joke at all to suggest that you would have a town with a mayor and its own schools. That's how most people live in America. 
Um, and I think it's something that we've been deprived of in Virginia. And I think fundamentally it's at the root of all the problems is, is we don't have a responsive local government. We have these weirdos like Carl Frisch that come in here from California and raise like over a hundred thousand dollars from all over the country to push their weird national activism. And that's just not the kind of thing that I think would happen if we had little towns with 5,000 people. Absolutely. Look, I can't let you go without asking another question. Uh, it is my understanding that you expose more than 60 districts indoctrinating and not educating. Where are all these multiple districts? Were they concentrated in specific states? How did you pick those districts? Um, I, I, I don't know that there was any real methodology to it. I just, I, I, I researched a lot of stuff and the, the craziest anecdotes uh, went into the book. I also tried to use different case studies. So I would show how there are some small towns that did get, you know, this woke dysfunctional stuff. Uh, it, it's not limited just to the problem I just mentioned. I, essentially, when I talk about school districts, I usually try to use them as metaphors so that you, even if you don't live in that school district, you can say, well, how are the same problems happening where I live? And so when I broke the story of Loudoun County covering up a rape by a guy wearing a skirt, a lot of people cared about that, but you should care about it even if you don't live in Loudoun or even in Virginia. And one of the takeaways is that they've been doing similar cover-ups all the time for years. So for example, during the Obama administration, um, he became obsessed with um, the racial discipline statistics in schools. And so a lot of, they called it the school to prison pipeline saying that um, black kids were being suspended and then that was causing them to become criminals. Mm. And it was, you know, kind of out on a limb. It's kind of a weird thing to say that it was the act of causing, if being suspended that caused otherwise good kids to become bad. Um, it's also kind of a conspiracy theory to say that teachers were like framing black kids for assaulting someone when they didn't actually do it. And, you know, think about it. It's, the Teachers aren't suspending kids for no reason. They don't have an incentive to, to frame black kids for crimes they did not commit. Um, but uh, President Obama put out this letter with the full force of the Department of Justice that said, if the if the racial if the suspensions by school districts were not equal when it came to race, um, you could get in all kinds of trouble. You know, basically be sued and hauled into court. And so what that caused was um, deception and cover up, very similar to the Loudon rape, where oftentimes it was black kids assaulting Asian kids. And what they wanted was more Asian kids to be suspended so they could balance out the stats and less black kids. And so there were Asian kids and, you know, in Philadelphia, there was some particularly egregious incidents that happened everywhere. Asian kids beaten to a pulp viciously every single day by black kids. And the schools were systematically covering it up so that they could present a spreadsheet that could be called equity. And so that's one of the things that um, is so important to know about equity is it's purely on paper what they they don't care if the actual world that you live in is burning to the ground equity for school administrators is a piece of paper it's a database or a spreadsheet that can make the schools look good and that's really what a lot of the um so we've talked about the foundations and the consultants why are the administrators wanting to do all this and one of the reasons or really the main reason is because they're failing at their only mission, which is teaching kids writing and science and math. And they have the test scores, which are horrible. Um, you know, the national, uh, the NAEP, which is like a national test, shows that only about a third of 12th graders can read. Only about 24% are proficient in math. Um, these are devastating statistics, and it's not for lack of funding. I mean, we spend well over $17,000 per kid in Fairfax County. Um, and so how do you live with yourself when you're getting $17,000 per kid and you can't even teach them to read by the time they're 18? I mean, it's, it's shameful. I don't think almost any of us are as bad at our jobs as you would have to be to get those kind of results. And so they become obsessed with how can we, what a, what a decent person would do when confronted with negative statistics is find a way to improve the situation. What these people do, and it, I think it makes them bad people, is they say, well, how can we conceal it? How can we trick people into thinking it's not as bad as it is? And that's where equity comes in. And that's where the consultants come in. And they'll say, well, you know, we don't actually have to increase the pipeline of black kids into TJ by helping them learn math. 
tests are racist. We've got to get rid of the test. And so they're anarchists. They're, they're, they want to burn everything to the ground. They, don't, they, they claim that nothing is real. It's all just this very fatalistic mindset. Nothing's real. Asking kids if they know the right answer on, on a math question is not a valid way to ascertain whether they know math. They don't actually believe any of this. They're, they're getting rid of meritocracy solely to defraud the public into thinking that they are not totally incompetent at their jobs. And they're doing all of us a disservice because society needs objectivity and meritocracy. Are you going to want to drive over a bridge or fly a plane driven mm -hmm. or flown by, you know, someone that um, shouldn't have you know, gotten into TJ or gotten a math uh, credential, um, but also by the, you know, the minorities who are basically um, deprived of what they can do is we all know that they're just like anyone else. They can succeed. We just have to believe in them. We can't start giving up on them and just lowering or abolishing standards altogether so that the pieces of paper look good. And people do talk about grade inflation. There are some really striking charts where you can see that there's essentially no correlation between who um, the, the state exams that measure per, you know, uh, proficiency in an objective way, and then grades. The teachers are just basically giving out A's like candy. And it's not to make your kid feel good. People talk about like snowflakes or giving kids all the trophy. That's not what it is. They don't care about your kid. They're doing it to make themselves look less incompetent. And so it's a total fraud on the American people to have these teachers be sending kids home with A's so their parents think that their schools are not failing them when in fact the kids are failed, they are being failed by the schools. And so one of the things that I like to tell people to do is um, stay focused on these test scores. When you, if you show up at a Fairfax County school board meeting, ask them about the SOLs. And if they're talking about um, a new policy, say they wanna talk about menstrual equity again and how they wanna put tampons in elementary schools, ask them, how is this going to affect test scores and, and what's the proof of that? Um, because once you start confronting them with test scores and bringing every single question back to test scores, they really can't argue with it because teaching kids is the mission of a school. Um, testing is a valid way to measure it, their performance. It's really the only valid way. And so at the root of it is when you think about all these equity stuff and really a lot of the liberal stuff in general, it's all about emotion and feelings and SEL. The common theme there is that you can't quantify SEL. You can't quantify a kid's emotion and they're doing everything they can to move from an objective way where we could hold teachers and school administrators responsible for their performance to a subjective way where everyone can just do whatever they want. And we're supposed to pretend the schools are working well when they're clearly not. Look, this conversation is so very enlightening. I just want to ask what next? Do you intend to have more books published on the issues facing our school, uh, schools and education? Or, are you, or I, again, as you know, our nation is in crisis. We have inflation, soaring grass prices, midterm elections are coming, or will you be focusing on that? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm trying I to do that other, all that other stuff you mentioned. What I'm hoping is that parents can kind of pick up where I left off because uh, there is this instinct, people that are kind of out there talking about schools like James Lindsay and Chris Rufo and others who are doing great work. There's this tendency for people to just say, well, can you come to my school district and save me, um, Chris Rufo? No, he can't. You've got to do the work. You guys as parents are the one on the ground. You guys are the only ones who can ask the questions. And, you know, when I broke the Loudoun County rape cover up, it wasn't all that hard to do. I didn't have secret skills that other parents didn't have. Um, parents can do this work now that they know the nefarious forces that are coming for your kids, the fact that they want to make your kids unhappy and illiterate, um, the fact that if we don't fix these public schools, even if you take your kids out and put them in private school, they're still going to have to live in a world when they grow up that's populated largely by public school graduates. Um, so the parents have got to do this work. It's not something they can rely on others to do. It's not something they can rely on the national media to do because there are 13,000 school districts and you know who's gonna be there? It's, it's the, the most natural people to do the work are, are the people who are on the ground and know it best. So I'm hoping you know, with what I put out in my book, Race to the Bottom, it kind of creates a roadmap for what parents can do. And even reading the book is an act of, you know, people say, oh, can you just fix the schools and tell me how to fix the schools in, in 30 seconds? It's not that if, if you could fix the schools in 30 seconds, they already would have been fixed. It does take work. 
it is hard. You mentioned, you know, parents, everyone's busy. We got to work. Any advocacy we do is, is on the side. And that is really hard. And the other side is sometimes professional activists that are able to wear you down. But we can do this because there's a whole lot more of us as regular parents than there are these crazy activists. Um, but yeah, so I'm hoping that I can do, do some national reporting um, and that, you know, parents will continue, uh, you know, for as long as they can years into the future monitoring this, because I do think that schools are the most important thing um, in politics and public policy, but also one of the most objective failures and the, the test scores really lay it all out there. Look, I think parents that are hearing now or will hear later on, you said it loud and clear. It's not a, a journalist or investigative journalist job. We just really have to uh, roll up our sleeves and get the work done as parents. Luke, I thank you for coming. I know you're a very busy guy. You live in the neighborhood. I appreciate you taking the time to join us at Fairfax GOP and kind of supporting. I know you come to our membership meetings and educate our things, but I think this is a one good way for us to get to the message to the parents. So I thank you for joining us on Conversations That Count. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Luke. Uh, viewers, next week on Friday, July 16th at 6 p.m. at the same time, we will have Craig Rucker. Craig is the co-founder and executive director of the Co Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. It's called a CFAC. It was founded in 1985 to promote a positive voice on environment and developmental issues. Hope you all will tune in and listen to that sessions as well. So if you see Luke around uh, in Fairfax County, I'm sure he's one of our neighbors. Please thank him for his great work and continue to buy his books and encourage him to do more work on our behalf. And as he said, we also have to be advocates and strong advocate and sustain our advocacy. That is going to be the key in order to not only win elections, but also continue to be engaged. Until then, have a great weekend and upcoming week. God bless you all and God bless America. Thank you.